Uh, you, if you want to turn in your Bibles, we'll begin in, chapter, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Today. So first, let's ask God's blessing on our class. Our Father, be with us this morning and with your spirit enlighten us. Uh, give us the desire to learn and uh, give, give us the capability of learning, open a truth to us clearly. We pray that you may be glorified this morning in what we do. Pray truth may be taught. And we ask in Christ's name. Um, so far in 2 Corinthians, we have, Paul has dealt with two topics. One of them is, as you know, those of you who have been here, one of them is the relationship that he had with Corinthians, which had been damaged, damaged especially by all the criticisms that he had to lay out in the first letter. And particularly by the problem caused by this man living with his uh, stepmother. But it had been complicated by a number of people who, un unknown to us, unnamed people, who were trying to undermine Paul's reputation and create problems with gossip and such like. So quite a bit, of, as you know, quite a bit of what we have seen so far, what we've studied so far, has dealt with that problem, trying to reestablish the relationship. And he will continue to deal with that somewhat in the last chapter. The second thing which we've noticed and which I think is most valuable and intriguing is presenting truth, doctrinal truth, an explanation of the gospel that goes deeper in a different way, totally consistent with everything else in, in the New Testament and throughout the Bible. Totally consistent, but giving us insights that we do not find anywhere else. So those two things, the uh, relationship matter and the doctrinal matter. We're at the midway point in the letter now, and he turns to the, the subject of the great collection, which we would say is in the general category of stewardship. Uh, this is the perhaps the most extensive discussion of stewardship that we find anywhere in Scripture. You may remember some time back when we started our uh, fundraising for the new building that I was asked to do a series of class, combined classes where we studied that subject and particularly looking at, at this portion of Second Corinthians. But now we can at least see it in context. Um, you can understand why he would not deal with it until this point, because he had to deal with the relationship problem first, and only now he can turn to this. This great collection um, was for Christians living in Jerusalem who were obviously in need. Some people said there was a famine there. We don't know exactly what the problem was, but they were in need, and there was a collection taken up among churches in Asia Minor and churches in Europe across the Aegean Sea, and then those, that, those two collections were combined. They may have been combined when Paul met with the elders uh, at Ephesus in Acts 20. Um, we know that in, in Galatians 2.10, he mentioned that we should remember the poor. Well, this is certainly an example of remembering the poor. We know that the collection started in Corinth that they were extremely excited about being able to help these needy Christians in Jerusalem. But that had fallen by the wayside. And I think you can understand why. Because from the time they started it, Paul, they received this first letter from Paul that's just filled with criticisms, filled with uh, their errors and mistakes, uh, their, the things they were doing that needed attention, needed correction, and particularly the problem with the incestuous. Me. So that had to kind of uh, caused them to lose their zeal for helping the Christians in, in Jerusalem. That was a year before. And we find a reference to that 
in chapter 9. So I'm going to just go ahead to chapter 9 for a moment and read verse 1, where Paul said, Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints, for I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia, remember Corinth is Achaia, has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. So what Paul is saying is that they started a year before, and we know that from what he says later, that Titus went there and told them about the problem in Jerusalem. That gave them the the information they needed, and they were just really dedicated and zealous about giving. So their uh, their zeal was used to ignite the the interest in the people in Macedonia. So you see, he said, I told them, I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has been ready since last year. Now, since then, the whole situation is reversed. Since then, the Corinthians have lost interest in this great collection. The Macedonians, on the other hand, have been on fire for it. So now the Macedonians are being used, their example, to stir up the Corinthians. Um, just as a side note, the people who went to Jerusalem with Paul after they combined these two contributions from Asia and from Europe are named by Luke in Acts 20 verse 4. Luke almost runs a parallel account to this. And he names these people, Sopater the Berean, or he is in Macedonia, the son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius of Derby, um, Derby's in Asia Minor, Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. So we have a, a group of people uh, representing both Europe and Asia, separated by the Aegean Sea, that are going with Paul to Jerusalem. Um, in the 16th chapter, this is all background, I'm just leading up to, to chapter 8, but I want to spend some time so you'll understand the context. In 1 Corinthians 16, as he ends that letter, he said, Now collect, concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by a letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should do also, they will accompany me. Now, remember that the, the Corinthians had already started. This is just information about how to do that and how to continue. First day of the week, lay, buy in store, contribute. We don't know whether this was a contribution taken up in church service, worship, which I think it was. Some of it suggested they just simply kept it at home. But I think they had that collection. We don't know at church. But they are to give something each week, and then that accumulates, and that goes to Jerusalem. So he's giving them advice on how to do it. They were already aware of it, obviously, because there's only six months difference between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Uh, and that's not a year, so uh, they are, he's just encouraging them. I think encouraging them at the end, this is, I'm trying to think for Paul and I, at the end of 1 Corinthians, because he realizes what he'd written in the first chapters, which would be very discouraging to anybody to read. Uh, when he went to, um, to Rome and was being tried before the Roman governor Felix, he even mentioned that contribution as a reason that he was going to Jerusalem defending himself. In other words, I haven't come here, haven't come to Jerusalem uh, to cause problems. He was accused of, this is on his way of, he wind up in Rome, of course, but he was accused of uh, disturbing the temple, bringing Gentiles in, all kinds of things were said about him, and he was arrested in, in Jerusalem. So here's his comment 
in Acts 24, 17. After several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. So Felix, this is why I am in Jerusalem. I am presenting uh, this contribution to these needy people here. Paul, as we go through this now, um, he is going to try, and I think this is an important thing for us, he is going to try to present the right attitude and framework by which we should give. Uh, he never in this just says, you've got to do it. He does not legalistically and authoritatively command them. He wants them to do it of their, we would say, their free will. They do it of their own volition. Uh, remember that over and over again, at least twice, I know, but we've talked about it. He said, I don't want to cause any offense. So he's trying to avoid offending them. Now you offend people when you talk about money, don't you? Uh, that's just something that is, can be very touchy. And so he does not want to offend them. And I think really he, he lays down the, the Christian way of doing it that's consistent with the principles of the gospel. He wants to make their participation pure and true in every way. He wants to make it a product of the gospel spirit. Um, he's trying to, to make them delight in giving. They, they, at once, they started that way, but now the Macedonians are delighting in giving. He wants them to also delight in giving. Now, he writes to the Romans. When he finally gets to Rome, uh, on, of course, on trial, when he gets to Rome, this is how he defends his behavior. This is in Romans 15, 26 through 28. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. Macedonia, up north, Achaia, south, in the Balkan Peninsula. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. We believe that the letter to the Romans was written from Corinth. And so thus he is saying here in Romans 15, this is what happened. Uh, and his, his, his argument is, these Jews, Christ, Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, have shared their spiritual wealth with the Gentiles. Now the Gentiles have the opportunity to share their material wealth with their Jewish brothers and sisters. And there's a balance. So, uh, are there any questions? This is kind of the background of all of this. Um, relevant to us at Stevens Valley? Absolutely. Uh, we're trying to put together enough funds to build that building that many of us saw underway yesterday that takes, takes funds. Uh, one might say, well, this is, we're not talking about uh, relieving people's physical needs, but this could become a base of operations to do that very thing, to do all kinds of, of Christian ministry. So it is relevant for us, uh, this whole idea of stewardship at this particular point, it's always relevant. No question. Okay. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 8. Let me read to verse 7. We're only going to take seven verses. Uh, I have quite deliberately taken half the time to give you this background, but I think this background is important because you see how many times and many places in the New Testament this great collection is mentioned. Um, and I don't know who really started it, where it started, who's responsible for the idea originally, but we do know that Titus goes to uh, Corinth, and we know from, from Corinth it goes to Macedonia, we know, but we know there's a collection going on in, in Asia Minor, so it started somewhere by somebody. 
Now, let's read 2 Corinthians 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Now, let's look at that a little more closely. How many times did you hear the word grace? Actually, three, really four. There are four because the word is translated a little differently once. And the first point that Paul is making is that giving is a grace. It is an expression of God's grace to us. I can say, yes, my, what I own, what I have in the bank account, my physical possessions, the money I have, that's an expression of God's grace, but that's not what Paul is saying. He is saying that in giving, that is an expression of God's grace. That God has, is glorified and has graciously allowed us to take part in that. In many ways, of course, not only providing the means, but the will and the whole situation, the ability. All of this is an act of God's grace. Uh, everything about the Christian faith is an act of His grace. So he says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Look north to Macedonia. Calvin said, when we give help to our brethren, we should ascribe it to God's grace and should count it an extraordinary privilege to be eagerly sought. Most people don't look at it that way. It is an act of grace. Now, let's move to the second verse. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. He says a lot in that verse. First of all, he says the Macedonians had undergone a severe test of affliction. I don't know what that is. Uh, whether it was uh, something like a famine or whether it was just what it was, we don't know. It's a severe, could be persecution. Indeed, a severe test of affliction. And then he says their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. I want you to notice the contrast, the opposites. Affliction, their severe test of affliction, abundance of joy. Those are opposites. Affliction, joy. Extreme poverty and wealth of generosity. Affliction, joy, poverty, wealth. He says that for a purpose. To understand that there can, we can be in extremities, we can be in extreme situations, and yet joy can completely overcome affliction. So that we don't see the affliction, we see the joy. That's what Christian joy is. It's not giddiness and happiness. It is a quality of our souls that is not diminished by experiences of suffering. It still is there. And it can, in fact, and this is the word of Calvin, their joy became great enough to swallow up their sadness. It's a spiritual comfort by which believers sustain themselves in time of affliction. That's something Christians have that the world doesn't, the believer doesn't have that. Now, that, this, this, this affliction versus joy, let's go to the other contrast here. Poverty and wealth. 
their extreme poverty, and in their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Out of poverty, not only poverty, but extreme poverty, there's a wealth of generosity that overflows. The word extreme poverty is interesting here. Uh, the Greek word is hekatabathus. You, you know that kata, I've said this many times, kata is an intensifying word. If it is combined with a verb, it takes that verb to the nth degree. We don't have things like that in English. Uh, that's why the Greek is a very expressive language. So, if it's a preposition used in front of something, as it is, is here, it's going to intensify that. <coughs> Actually, it says, a kata by itself can mean <coughs> down from, but you put that in front of <coughs> poverty. <coughs> it is, it magnifies it, it intensifies it. So, their extreme poverty, literally, they're down to the very bottom of poverty. Because the word bathus, remember now it's combined with kata, the intensifier. The word bathus is bottom. So kata, down to the very bottom of poverty. He could not have said that any stronger than he did. Uh, the Greeks, of course, uh, as you know, made pots and vessels out of clay and all of that. And this is an expression they used because they stored everything in, in these vessels. They stored grain and they stored wine and they stored um, oil and everything else. So they go to the pot, to the vessel, and they look into it and it's totally empty. It's been drained to the bottom. And that's kind of a, a disappointing feeling. And that's the expression they would use. It's Katabathus, it's down to the very bottom. I told you to go get some oil. No, I went to the pot, the vessel, and looked, and there's nothing in it. It's down to the bottom empty. That's the expression he uses here. So these Macedonians have been drained to the very bottom, but their down to the bottom poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity. And you see what he's trying to say to these Corinthians. Look at the Macedonians. Out of this down to the bottom of poverty, they have overflowed in a wealth of generosity. In the midst of extreme severe test of affliction, they experienced an abundance of joy. That is a phenomenon that can happen only to a Christian. And one other thing about <clears throat> their generosity. Some of the versions translate that liberality. Out of their liberality, neither translation is adequate because that word, apolites, means single-mindedness, a single focus. They were so focused on helping these needy saints in Jerusalem, so very focused single-minded that they didn't notice their extreme poverty and they gave out of that extreme poverty that down to the bottom poverty so he said a lot to these Corinthians who would understand of course the Greek language in that second verse for they verse 3 they gave according to their means lay by as you have could prosper they gave according to their means, but look at the rest of it. As I can testify and beyond their means of their own accord. So they not only gave according to means, they gave beyond means, and they gave willingly of their own accord. So we talk about free will offerings. The Bible talks about free will offerings. That, that is, I want to do it. I want to give they gave willingly, and look at verse 4, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Look behind that word begging, and there's obviously the implication that Paul and Titus had probably said to these Macedonians, 
you're overdoing it. We don't expect you to give that much. I mean, you're going through some difficult times. This is all that's expected. And these Macedonians are saying, please take this, these funds to Jerusalem. They begged Paul and Titus to take it. So this is an amazing thing. And this, verse 5 now, and this, not as we expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. Uh, let me back up for a moment. I, I left something out that I, I wanted to say. Let's back up to this point in verse 4 for the favor of taking part in the belief of the saints. I told you there's another grace in here that's not translated grace. That word favor in verse 4 is grace. They begged us earnestly for the grace. That word taking part is the word fellowship. And that word relief is the word diakonos, deacon, minister. So we don't get the flavor and the meaning of it because literally what that is going to say is they begged us for the grace and the fellowship, sharing, fellowship, of the ministry. The grace and the fellowship of the ministry. I oh, nearly went by that one. I think that's important to look at. That's the fourth time that grace is used. But the way it's used, the grace and fellowship of the ministry. That gives us a kind of understanding of how Christian giving should be. All right. So they first gave themselves to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. They, the reason that they were able to do this is that they had first given themselves to the Lord, dedicated themselves to the Lord, and then to us. Uh, that reminds us of the... The, the widow who gave her all, who gave everything in, in the temple. Um, how did they give? Paul said they gave according to and above their ability. They gave as people acting of their own accord, free will. They gave by begging Paul and Titus to allow them to give. They gave not merely as Paul and Titus had hoped. Those four things are how they gave, but what they gave that enabled them to give in that way, they gave themselves to the Lord. Any time that God and man are participating in a joint effort together, as here, they gave themselves to the Lord and then to us. Any time that happens, it is first the Lord and secondly us. Anytime that happens, the us knows that it is the will of God. There's, God has revealed in some way that this is what should be done. They gave themselves to the Lord, and then knowing that the right thing to do, that to please God, is to give this money to the needy saints in Jerusalem, they gave themselves to us. Let me give you a couple of other examples of that. In Acts 15, 28. Remember, this is the Jerusalem conference. Uh, what do the Gentiles need to do? How much of the law do they need to keep? This is James speaking. And James says, For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, mainly stay away from idols. First, the Holy Spirit. Secondly, us. It seems good to the Holy Spirit. And James can say, and to us, because James knows this is what the Holy Spirit wants. Uh, a third example of God and man working together. In Exodus 14, thus the Lord, verse 30, saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and the Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Is Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and here's the point, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. So 
the Lord and Moses. They believed in the Lord and they believed in Moses only because they knew it was the will of God. Anytime we commit ourselves to a human being in this way, where we're involved in a spiritual relationship, we jolly well better make sure that God comes first and that what we are doing is that which we know is the will of God, because that's the biblical example. So, uh, verse 6, accordingly we urge Titus that as he had started, so we know Titus started it before, so he should complete among you this act of grace. And as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. So once again, an act of grace. Any questions or comments? Jerry. I was thinking about this uh, interestingly that these are Gentiles sending gathering funds, sending it basically to uh, Hebrew believers Absolutely. in Palestine. I was wondering on a world scale how many times a benevolence thing like that had ever happened. And I started going through my mind, did Rome ever collect, you know, and send funds? Today it's not unusual about the Red Cross or the United States government sending funds to a disastrous area in another part of the world. But, uh, I mean, this is a great distance between my... <laughs> I think, you know, as far as, <clears throat> as freely a bunch of... Of, of Gentiles contributing to some Jews, you may be right there. This may be the first time this has ever happened. Um, and considering the normal antipathy between, especially by Jews against Gentiles, uh, this is remarkable. And, and, and it's a good example of the fact that in Christ all that those distinctions are lost. The only other thing I can think of in the background is in Genesis. When the famine came to Egypt, you know, and Joseph had warned them to store up, and then you had uh, yes. Jacob's sons coming, but they had to come to Egypt, but it wasn't sent to where they right. were. Right, yeah. come to Egypt. Exactly. Well, yes, one. I thought about how important God is in the marriage ceremony where both individuals, both Excellent example. I hadn't thought about that. That's excellent. If you didn't hear Roy, what he's saying, in a marriage ceremony, you've got two people committing themselves to each other. But in order for that to, I think what you're saying, succeed, they should commit themselves first to the Lord. Very good. Well, we did seven verses. This is kind of what's going on in these two chapters, and we'll see a lot more unfold as we go on. Let's pray. Father, we praise you, and we thank you for your word. Thank you that you have called us together. Thank you that you have placed in our hearts the love of your word, the love of you, the love of truth. Now be with us as we enter into worship, that we may worship you as we please you and glorify you in spirit and in truth. We ask in Christ's name. Amen.